I watched, yeah, pretty much every single one of Caitlin's games early on because I am a fan, I do like good basketball, and of course I wanted to see how she would do coming out of college and going into the WNBA we as WN. The players were having basketball conversations, and everybody just took it to another place where we were attacking them as people in the most surprising way possible. Subbird has revealed the WA's covert strategy to unsee Caitlin Clark from the beginning, and no, this wasn't a case of a terrible call going wrong. This was a fully orchestrated, prearranged circus. Clark didn't have to put up with this mess. The technical fouls, the racist overtones, the obvious targeting, it was a tactic devised by those who couldn't stand or taking center stage. I simply don't and as, you are aware we have already discussed this, such as the fan. I can't recall the specific incident where the fan nearly got disqualified during the Connecticut Sioux game, but it went hard at Caitlin in either game one or two. We never seemed to grasp the fact that none of this is acceptable on the side of the guys. We never accept this. Apparently, the WA's new playbook is drama and an envy. So Kathy Engelbart and her team of referees understood precisely what they were doing. You can throw her under the bus for little more controversy in ticket sales. So why support a budding star thanks to Sue? The unclean laundry has been removed, but it doesn't look good. What makes it acceptable in our league? Why is mainstream sports? Oh, welcome and don't worry. Sue didn't reveal that the WNB. Because she felt a great deal of pity for Caitlin Clark, don't fool ourselves, it was a mistake, a lovely inverted one who's complaining though everything now makes sense, especially in light of Bird's recent over-remarks that let's be honest has done nothing but disparage. We finally got the delicious facts we've always suspected were boiling beneath the surface of Caitlin Clark's record-breaking rookie season, you know, the one when... She literally set the league on fire and had figures most players could never have dreamed. Not only the commissioner's comments from a few weeks ago, in which she basically implied that racial friction is good for business by bringing up magic and birds, but Sue decided to brush that off as irrelevant on her podcast, referring to the league's achievements as team effort. It's true that teamwork makes the idea come true. But please don't act as though Clark didn't introduce the WNBA to a whole new audience on his own. There were higher television ratings, more people attending, ladies and gentlemen, and since she was the most popular, she might have increased your bottom line. Taken full advantage of it, the atmosphere quickly caught on with critics as well. Was Bird merely being sentimental, or was she subtly criticizing Clark because it sounded like an attempt to dampen the spirits of someone who has been effortlessly stealing the show and setting records one after or another? It's not beneficial for me. Additionally, there is a nagging suspicion that this may not just some harmless remarks. Is it uneasiness or jealousy? Perhaps it's something a little more intimate. Or perhaps it's just a veteran showing tough love. Ultimately, Clark's ascent hasn't been quiet. Rather, it's been, let's face it, for someone who's been around as long as Bird, it might hurt a little to see a rookie steal all the spotlight she's accomplished in a year. What other players never come close to intend. This is where things get very not. Though Bird's remarks are only one aspect of the larger issue. Another is if the WA's leadership was covertly trying to prevent Clark from becoming very prominent, perhaps a conspiracy theory. But let's discuss, for example, during practice, when it comes to technology, basketball is a little more complicated than tennis. For instance, when it comes to officiating technology, we are looking at many dimensions right before a playoff game in Connecticut. Caitlin Clark, a once-in-a-generation rookie, received the news that she had one rookie of the year via phone call. Of course, not all of them are human. No celebration, no hoopla, we don't want to make a huge deal out of you, so if it doesn't yell, I'm not sure what works. Another factor is the officiating. Just a phone call saying, Oh, hey, congrats, as if to let her know that her dry cleaning was completed. I received a technical for essentially, um, he told me it was disrespectful to the game of basketball since I was upset with myself for missing the three and then hitting the backboard the officiating O, recall the time Clark missed a shot and in fury struck the backward lightly earning him a technical foul. In fact the referee deemed it insulting to the game. Really veteran players like Diana Tossi meanwhile have performed poorly and hardly received. A sidelong glance from the referees, the double standard is so obvious that it might be illuminated by neon lights. 
They seemed to have one set of rules for Clark and another for the rest of them. We WNBA players were having basketball talks when we first entered the league after graduating from college and everyone took it to another level where we were disparaging them personally. The signs continued to accumulate and present a picture that is not only concerning it enrages me was the WNBA attempting to control Clark because they were worried that her quick ascent would overshadow their well-constructed story of group development, if such is the case the choice is both perplexing and counterproductive. The league is not in danger from Clark. Its greatest asset is her. She is attracting new fans, raising TV ratings, and increasing ticket sales, all of which are much needed by the league. However, it appears that they are cautious, perhaps afraid to allow her to shine too brightly rather than embracing her. And that's where the jealousy and sympathy reside once more. But here's the really bad part. There is more to Caitlin Clark than just the league, the current wave of excitement. The league is experiencing would not have occurred, therefore the leadership is hurting themselves, even if they may believe they are defending the brand. The brand brand is the players. There would be no league, no audience, and no future without them. The subtle rookie of the year announcement, the questionable officiating, and Sue Bird's patronizing comments all work together to send a clear and grating message. Caitlin, I would like to reset one thing that we wish to start over. And that is the words that are spoken in front of supporters, Caitlin lovers, Fever fans, and new fans. They must be careful not to upset anyone, but this is the reality they must face. Caitlin Clark does more than just upset people. Whether they like it or not, she is taking the league to new heights, and if they can't accept it, they will be the ones to sink. It's easy to answer questions during an interview, so I can understand why it's been utilized infrequently. Oh, the Fever fan base, yes. What do you mean when you say that these new admirers need to be eliminated? Oh, it needs to be taken out since that isn't the Fever fans. Fans of Caitlyn are not involved. The WNBA commissioner, Angelart, has a habit of making things tense, and not in a good way, at family gatherings. Her leadership style is like the awkward relative who always says something embarrassing, for instance. The clearest and worst example of her obsession with rivalries as the league's key to relevance is when she positioned Caitlin Clark and Angel Reese as the next big thing in basketball rivalry. Consider making Larry Bird versus Magic Johnson needlessly racially charged gets you a lot of attention, and when that happens, everyone is worried. If you recall the Bird Magic moment from 1979, when those two rookies arrived from a fierce college rivalry, it is kind of reminiscent of that moment. Yes, in an interview with CNBC Power Lunch, it was boldly noted that the fact that Clark is white and Reese is black makes sports exciting, but she didn't hit the right note if nostalgia was her goal. Instead, she received a flurry of criticism for exploiting racial dynamics for commercial gain. The worst part is yet to come. Let's analyze this. Engelbert's attempt to create excitement blew out rather than just failing. Fans and commentators swiftly criticized her for being tone-deaf, claiming that instead of praising the talents of two exceptionally gifted players, she reduced them to their skin colors. Rhea and Clark have both been the targets of disgusting racist taunts at games and online. One black, one white, so we have that instance with these two. However, I am aware that competition is important in sports because people watch rivals play games of consequence and don't want people to be kind to each other. This is a balance, but corporate partners are supporting these guys much more now than they were five years ago, at least in terms of marketing dollars. Was that something Engelbart considered addressing? Clearly not. Instead, she made things worse for both players by essentially adding gasoline to the fire because using racial conflict as a selling point is the definition of progressive leadership, isn't it? The criticism came in faster than a three-pointer from Clark Subbird, and Megan Rapino were blunt in their Touch More podcast. Engelbert was assailed by Reno, who said that she prioritized gaudy marketing over player safety and mental health. When Reno stated that racial tension is beneficial for business, she essentially summed up what everyone was already thinking. She also noted that the administration seems more interested in garnering publicity than resolving issues, 